Virian and Alder headed back to the castle, while Art stayed behind to see his mother and father off. They were insistent about rejoining the Twin Horns and helping out in the war. As they said their goodbyes, Art tried to dissuade them from going near the western shore where the fighting would be the heaviest, but they were adamant. As frustrated as Art was, he couldn't blame them. For him, there may have been a certain amount of detachment, despite growing up here, since he remembered his previous life. He considered Dickathan his home because this was where his family was, which was a large factor as to why he decided to fight against the Vritra. But for his parents, this land was truly their home. Protecting it was only natural. After they'd gone, Art removed the last of his armor, sank into his seat, and let out a deep breath. Damn it, he cursed, rubbing his temples. Getting into an argument with them wasn't the best way to part, Sylvie said, lying down with her head on her paws on the polished tea table. Thank you for enlightening me. Art rolled his eyes. I just don't understand why they wouldn't listen to my advice. I didn't say anything wrong. You basically told them to go off into some remote area and stay hidden, she replied. Those were not the words I used, he retorted, kicking off his boots. But that's what you meant. I just want them to stay safe, Art murmured, conceding her point. Sylvie hopped off the tea table and onto the armrest of his chair. If your parents were concerned about their own safety, they wouldn't have joined the war. Well, I'm more concerned about my family's safety than this war. I'm thankful that they're at least leaving Ellie behind, but that doesn't mean they should just go out risking their lives. Sylvie nodded. I know. I just hope they understand that my concern comes from being their son, not from some... Art's voice trailed off as he sighed deeply. It's going to be hard for them to discern now that they know, Sylvie said softly, placing a comforting paw on his arm. Art sank lower into his seat and stared at Sylvie for a moment. When exactly did you figure out what I was anyway? I think I've always known, but I just could never come up with the term to describe it. We do share thoughts after all. Every thought? Art asked, stunned. Mm-hmm. But you only answered when I spoke directly to you. And I don't hear your thoughts unless you're speaking directly to my mind. For me, speaking to your mind is much like speaking out loud. I've learned to keep some thoughts hidden. I can't say the same for you, though. She giggled. Art's eyes grew wide in horror. That means... Sylvie grinned. Do I know about your constant emotional turmoil when it comes to Tessia? Yup. Art groaned. Don't worry. I've listened to all your fleeting thoughts since I was born. I didn't start understanding until a bit later, but I've grown used to it over the years, she said consolingly, her sharp teeth still showing as her grin remained. Well, I haven't grown used to anything at all, Art grumbled. Sylvie's grin faded as she stared at him with her bright yellow eyes. We're going to battle soon. Grandfather told me during training that, while I'm far from reaching the level of a true Asura, his blood still runs through me. This means that though I can fight alongside you in this war, I'm not invincible. The best way to stay alive is to rely on each other. Of course, Art said, a bit confused. What had brought this on? I'm saying this because there are things that I've hidden from you, things I've just found out recently, and I feel like you're the only one I can trust with my life, she said, reading his mind. Sylv, you know you can trust me with whatever it is. I've raised you since you were born, after all. Thank you. Sylvie hopped off the armrest and onto his seat, resting her head on his lap. There was a moment of silence as Art pondered what she had said. He knew she could read his thoughts, but, as she mentioned, it really didn't matter. As curious as he was, he didn't bother asking her what these things were that she had found out. She would have already told him if she wanted to. What worried him was the fact that this was the first time she had expressed any sort of fear for her life. Despite their numerous encounters with dangerous situations, she had always remained strong and fearless. But now, he could feel her apprehension toward this war. He gently stroked Sylvie's soft head. How did you get so smart anyway? 
It seems like ever since coming back from Ephiotis, you've grown at a remarkable rate. And don't get me started on your growing ego. You're just bitter because you're taking life advice from a fox younger than you. And I've always been a fast learner. Why do you think I always stayed on top of your head? So, you were learning by observing our surroundings? He asked. Yup. It helps that you know a lot, and that I have free access to your thoughts, Sylvie confirmed as she nestled in closer to Art's leg. He could tell she was tired. Although he had a thousand questions about her sudden apparent change in demeanor, he knew he had to wait. Art watched his bond as she slept soundly, her breathing steady. She hadn't really changed much. There was still a sense of immaturity in her voice despite the change in the way she spoke. It felt like she was forcing herself to become more mature. He wasn't sure what Lord Indrath had drilled into her while training her, but one thing was for sure. She had become aware that she was an Asura. As Sylvie's breathing became slower and more rhythmic, Art leaned his head back on the chair, staring up at the ceiling of his room while he organized his thoughts. Virian and the others didn't know this, but Winsome had told Art what Agrona and his clan were like. He and the rest of the Vritra had been experimenting on what the Asuras called lesser races, even before they had escaped to Alacria. From what he'd heard, the first mages to appear at the Wall weren't anything special, but it was likely that they were simply cannon fodder, meant to create mayhem and divide their forces with the mana beasts under their control. If what Winsome said was true, then the horde of ships approaching their shores would include mages with Asura blood coursing through their veins and they'd had centuries to explore that bond. Art could only imagine how much they had progressed since then and what they would do to the people of Dickathan if the Vritra won this siege. This place could become a breeding ground for soldiers, which Agrona would use to conquer Ephiotis. Arthur! The hoarse baritone voice snapped Art out of his thoughts. Isn't there some sort of etiquette about knocking when entering someone's room, or at least using the door? The tone of your response tells me things didn't go well with the business you had to take care of, Aldir said as he calmly took a seat on the couch across from Art. Why are you here? I thought you would be with the council, Art said, ignoring his comment. There is something I need from you, Aldir replied, his piercing gaze directed at Art. Art stared back, unwavering. And what is that? There was a tense silence, then Aldir sighed. Your help, he admitted. Lord Indrath told me to rely on your judgment throughout the course of this war. And after your speech earlier, I think I understand why. What did he mean by rely on my judgment? Art asked. Sylvie stirred awake as he sat up, but drifted back to sleep almost immediately. Lord Indrath realized that your contribution to this war shouldn't be limited to just being a sword. While there will be times when you'll be needed in the field, Sending you out to every battle will only tire you out. When you aren't absolutely needed, you'll be by my side in the council, strategizing with us and giving us your input. Let me get this straight. You want a 16-year-old making life-changing decisions with the council? Art scoffed. Aside from the fact that you are just a lesser, you're not a normal child. Don't think that this eye is just a pretty decoration. I knew there was something different about you the first time we met but only by Lord Indrath's words did I realize just how much. Is there something I get in return for helping you? Art asked, resting his head on his hand. Aldir's eye narrowed. I came in good faith to ask for your help, but it benefits us both if you cooperate. Losing this war means dying, being enslaved, or worse. Not just for you, but for your loved ones as well. You could have at least thrown me a bone, Art said, smiling at Aldir's seriousness. Yeah, I'll help, but I'm not sure how much of my advice the Council is willing to listen to. Virian might listen, but everyone else... Let me worry about that, Aldir replied. Besides, you won't only be in meetings. I have other plans for you as well. When you say other plans like that, it sounds kind of ominous. As I said... You are a powerhouse in this war, maybe more so than the Lances given a few years. I would certainly not waste your abilities by having you do nothing but sit and listen to those lessers, I mean the Council, bicker with one another. Art shook his head with a helpless laugh. 
It must be frustrating for you, being here and restrained from helping despite the amount of manpower you could provide just by yourself. My time will come. If we defend against this siege successfully, then, with the help of the Dickathan army, our Asuras will be able to take care of Agrona and his weakened force. It seems like this war is far from over, Art said, absent-mindedly brushing his fingertips across Sylvie's back, drawing comfort from her sleeping form. Yes, but this fight will be the start of a new era. If Dickathan wins and fights alongside us Asuras, Agrona and his clan of traitors and mutts will fall, and we will all gain access to a new continent. Aldir sounded hopeful, almost excited, despite his usual calm demeanor. You've lost someone to Agrona, haven't you? Art asked, seeing the expression on the Asura's face. Many of us lost loved ones in that battle. No, it would be better described as a massacre, Aldir answered, the brow underneath his third eye twitching. Well, you heard what I told Virian. I have no intentions of losing this war, but if you're going to ask my help in this, you need to trust in the advice that I do give. Laughing through his nose, Aldir replied, Never in all my years would I have imagined a lesser would speak to me like this. Well, these lessers are fighting your battles for you, so at least have the decency to call them by the names of their actual race, Art replied. You ask for a lot, Arthur Lewin, but very well. The white-haired Asura stood up, smoothing out the creases in his ivory robe. It's about time I headed back down to the meeting room. It worries me every time I leave those people alone for too long. We will be expecting you shortly. Sure, I'll be down soon, but I'm curious about something. What is it? The Asura replied, looking back over his shoulder. The two remaining lances who couldn't join us today. I know you said two years ago that they're working under you, but you didn't kill them or anything, right? Alder shook his head. Even I wouldn't be so rash as to kill a lance on a whim. While political envoys can be replaced, a lance's power can take years to develop, even if they have a particularly high compatibility with the artifact. I had planned on bringing up the subject at the meeting, but since you mentioned it, I'd like your input on this matter. Art nodded eagerly as the Asura revealed his plan for the two missing lances. Then an idea struck him. He let out a devious laugh and grinned wickedly at Aldir. Not bad, but I have a better idea. Wrapped tightly in his woolen cloak, Art trudged towards the bustling encampment, each exhale forming a cloud of frosty fog in the chilly air. Nestled beneath a cliff beside the shore, the soldiers had erected their tents and kindled fires shielded behind a massive rock formation that rose over twenty feet high. From a distance, the soft glow of flickering flames and wisps of smoke could be seen, while the towering wall of boulders provided a natural barrier against any threats approaching from the sea. Peering through the dense haze enveloping the beach, Art could just discern a few sentries stationed atop the cliff, their forms obscured by the swirling mist. He tightened his cloak and layered himself in another shield of mana, warding off the biting winter winds as he approached the encampment. We're almost there, Art informed Sylvie, who had nestled deep within the layers of his clothes. His bond peeked her head out, grumbled sourly, and promptly retreated back inside his cloak. For such a mighty being, you're surprisingly sensitive to the cold, he teased, pressing on with the last leg of their trek. You're not the one who had to fly through that cursed wind. It feels like my wings have holes in them even in this form, Sylvie complained. And I'm not weak to the cold, I just hate it. Art chuckled softly and quickened his pace. They had declined a truce with Alacria, so Aldir couldn't risk creating teleportation gates anymore. This left Sylvie as their only means of long-distance travel, where gates didn't exist. He had her transform just a mile back to avoid drawing attention. Virian had requested that Art stay with this division, prepared to assist in case Alacrian ships ventured this far down the coast. However, Art had added another item to his agenda without Virian's knowledge. Walking along the base of the cliff, Art concealed his presence expertly. Unlike most mages who simply nullified their mana, his training in Ephiatus had honed his ability to maintain a delicate balance of mana output through his channels and input through his veins. 
This allowed him to evade detection, even from vigilant mana beasts, while retaining the ability to wield mana. He noticed a conspicuously large tent with a peaked roof positioned near the cliff's base, where the boulders formed a natural barricade. Given its location in the safest part of the semicircular encampment and its size, three times larger than any other nearby tents, Art inferred it belonged to the captain. Approaching the camp's edge, he casually picked up some broken pieces of wood and proceeded among the resting soldiers. No one paid him much heed. With his hood drawn up and arms full of branches and twigs, he appeared like any earnest young soldier eager to make a contribution to the war effort. As Art ventured further into the encampment, he encountered a diverse array of soldiers preparing for battle. Seasoned warriors meticulously polished their weapons and armor under the meager light of the fires, casting brief glances in his direction without much interest. Nearby, a group of younger soldiers, adorned in elaborate gear and wielding flashy staffs, sneered at Art's plain attire, their disdain evident. Sylvie, observing their expressions, hissed her disapproval. Those ignorant clowns have no idea who they're scoffing at. They'd be better used as bait. Easy there, Art soothed, amused. You sure picked up some colorful insults from Lord Indrath. Continuing deeper into the encampment, Art passed by the bustling cooking station. Large fires blazed in earthen pits created by magic, around which cooks prepared meals. Pots filled with stew bubbled invitingly, while sturdy men carved chunks of meat. A commanding voice cut through the activity. Clear the pots for the skewered meat. Ben Fear and Shren, get ready to start handing out the stew. It was a small framed woman with a fierce expression, wielding a ladle like a weapon rather than a tool, who barked orders. As Art walked past, the woman glanced over her shoulder and gave him a respectful nod. He was taken aback. He hadn't expected anyone to recognize him this far from civilization. Approaching the large tent in the farthest corner of the camp, Art was drawn to the high-pitched clash of metal on metal. Setting aside the branches he carried, he observed a circle of soldiers gathered around two augmenters engaged in a friendly bout. Their weapons emitted sparks despite the mana covering their blades, each demonstrating skillful parries and strikes. "'You've gotten better, Cedri,' remarked the short-haired soldier. He appeared slightly shorter than Art, yet his arms seemed unusually long. Utilizing his slender frame and elongated limbs, he delivered swift, erratic strikes with dual daggers. And yet, you're still a pain to fight against, Jonah, Cedri retorted confidently, evading Jonah's swipe. She fought at a disadvantage, using heavy gauntlets in close combat against an opponent who excelled in long-range attacks, but she held her ground without yielding. She deftly ducked, weaved, and parried Jonah's dual-wielding assault, capturing Art's interest in her skills. Something about her caught his attention, and upon closer observation of her ears, he realized what it was. She's a half-elf, Art pointed out to Sylvie, who had lost interest in the match and retreated back inside his cloak. At his observation, Sylvie peeked her head out again. Oh, she is. We haven't come across one other than that ill-tempered Lucas. Ill-tempered is putting it lightly, Art chuckled, his focus still on the duel. Shouldn't we notify the captain of our arrival? Sylvie reminded him. You're right, I got sidetracked. Art thought, turning away from the duel. You always do when it comes to these kinds of fights, Sylvie teased. There's something about close combat that makes a fight exciting, unlike long-range conjuring, Art agreed, walking back. When they reached the large white tent, Art was stopped by an armored guard gripping a halberd. What business do you have in here? The guard demanded, his gaze unyielding as Art stood before him with his hood covering half his face. Is this the captain's tent? Art asked calmly, exhaling deeply as he did so. I said, what business do you have in here? The guard repeated, his tone firm and unwavering. Without a word, Art held out a medallion. As the guard caught sight of it, his narrow eyes widened in shock. His gaze shifted from the gold medallion back to Art with a look of horror at the blunder he had made. I, I'm so sorry, gent. Shh. Art mouthed, cutting off the guard before he could finish speaking. He held up a hand. 
I don't want my visit to cause a stir, so let's just keep this between us. Yes, sir, the guard stammered, nodding vigorously as he opened the flap to allow Art entrance. Stepping into the spacious tent, Art felt a rush of warmth envelop his body. He shrugged off his cloak, feeling as if a layer of ice was melting from his face. His attention was immediately drawn to the flare hawk perched near the entrance. I remember her. Sylvie chimed in his head as she hopped to the ground. Art turned to the woman seated behind a small wooden desk who seemed unfazed by his sudden appearance. Professor Glory, he greeted her, offering a faint grin. She finally looked up, her face lighting up at the sight of her old student. His former team fighting mechanics professor appeared unchanged, with her tanned complexion and brown hair tightly tied back. Despite being indoors, she wore light armor, and her two giant swords leaned against a drawer behind her. It's good to see you, General Lewin, she said warmly, coming around her desk. 